I have made an eight-part in-depth analysis of the Kalam cosmological argument a couple of months ago, but due to the length of the series and being made before I started to do narration, and since at the moment I am making this video, my former account has been suspended, meaning that the series in question together with all my other videos are either temporarily or indefinitely unavailable, I wanted to do a one-video narrated summary of this series to make it more accessible to more people. In the case my account will be restored, I can redirect the people who want a more in-depth explanation of the counter-arguments I will outline in this summary to the original series. If this is not the case, I hope I can re-upload the whole 8-part series on this account. I am as of yet not confident that I will be able to do this since the series in their final video format is not stored on my computer since that would take up too much space. So time will tell if the series will be back up. Which is on the one hand interesting that I would phrase it like that, but on the other hand kind of lame since it's obvious that this video is scripted. But time will be the main topic of this video, and specifically the nature of time and the different views there are of the nature of time. But before I go into my actual counter arguments, I want to outline how I got to this series, and I want to outline the Kalam argument itself for the very few people who haven't heard this argument before. The main proponent of the Kalam argument, Dr. William Lane Craig, a philosopher, theologian and a well-known Christian apologist, had critiqued the very first video I had made on the Kalam argument on his website reasonablefaith.org in the question and answer section, question 71. You can find the link to his criticism in the description box. Since my video was kind all over the place and not very well written, most of Dr. Craig's criticism was based on a misunderstanding of my arguments, so I made a whole series on the Kalam argument as a response to his criticism, which I later remade into the series uh, this video is a summary of. So what is the Kalam argument? The Kalam argument is a philosophical deduction which tries to demonstrate that the universe, which in this context means the natural world, the world of matter, energy, time and space, requires a cause for its existence, which therefore needs to be a supernatural cause if it brought forth a natural world. Further argumentation is then provided to identify this cause as being a personal supernatural entity, ergo, God. The argument consists of two premises leading to a conclusion. It goes as follows. Premise 1. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Premise 2. The universe began to exist. Conclusion. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Premise 1 is a metaphysical statement, which I myself actually happen to deem as not only valid, but necessarily valid since the negation leads to the violation of logic itself, and is therefore impossible and without any possible proper justification. It is however completely irrelevant that this premise is a valid one, because I don't object to its validity, but to its application. For example, I could make this statement, everyone who eats a glurp becomes green. Now that statement could very well be true, but if there exists no such thing as a glurp, then this statement becomes meaningless. If a glurp would exist, it could very well be true, but there is no such thing. I have the same objection to the first premise of the Kalam, since there is no example of anything that has come into existence. The only thing we see in the universe are rearrangements of materials into different shapes. I myself am only 23 years old, but the matter that composes my body has been around since the first second after the Big Bang when it was formed from energy. To be more precise, every seven years all the matter that composes our bodies has been completely replaced by different particles. We observe formation, not creation. Now there are obviously objections to this. Dr. Craig said, well, did I not begin to exist even though the matter I am composed of has been around before, but that matter was not me. But this actually has nothing to do with the argument, because still nothing comes into existence. We are not dealing here with anything that comes into being, but we are dealing here with a certain time or event at which certain concepts or properties can be applied to a collection of rearranged matter. So if you want to say that it are the concepts that come into existence, then you have essentially shifted away from the argument itself, which is about the universe having to have come into existence, and moved to metaphysical forms of concepts. But even if you hold to the view that concepts are actually existing abstract entities like in a platonic form, then still they do not come into existence. Especially if you are a Christian, you would have to believe that all possible concepts exist timelessly within God's mind. You can only say that these concepts are only applicable on certain collections of matter at certain times. And if you want to say that the properties or attributes come into existence, then the notion of beginning to exist becomes even more arbitrary, since there is no way to identify at what specific moment, uh, for example, a car begins to exist as a car. Is a car before its wheels are mounted on a car already? Does a car go out of existence if the engine is taken out? 
actually by that logic the entire universe would go out of existence at any moment and would come into existence again at any moment since the universe is in a constant state of change. This would make premise 2 that the universe began to exist as arbitrary as it could possibly be since every single Planck second would be a moment of beginning to exist. So on to premise 2. Could it be that the universe itself began to exist? This is where the weakness of the column is found. This is the premise I disagree with. Many theists reply to me saying that since I believe that the universe did not begin to exist that I must believe that the universe is eternal. Well, define eternity first. Theists claim that the universe could not have an infinite past. I agree since actual infinities lead to logical contradictions making them logically impossible. So no, the universe could not be eternal in that sense. But there are two versions of eternity. When it comes to their God being eternal, Christians don't believe that their God has an eternal timeline, so to say, but that he is a timeless being. So they are talking in the case of their God about a timeless eternity and in the case of an impossible eternal universe of an omnitemporal eternity. It is indeed impossible for the universe to be omnitemporally eternal, but the universe can exist as a timeless entity. Now I am well aware that people who aren't familiar with the nature of time and the different views thereof don't understand my position that the universe is a timeless entity. You need to understand that the Kalam argument is based on what is called the dynamic view of time, also called the A theory of time, or the tensed view of time. This is the view of time that most people are familiar with, namely the view that only the quote-unquote now exists. So only the present exists, the past doesn't exist anymore, and the future does not yet exist. So both the past and the future are non-existent and only this moment is real. I, however, along with a lot of philosophers and scientists, especially cosmologists and physicists, hold to the view what is known as the static view of time, also called the B theory of time or the tenseless view of time. This is the view that there are not three dimensions of space and one dimension of time, but four dimensions of space and no dimension of time. Past, present and future are equally real and all moments exist simultaneously from a four-dimensional perspective. So not one moment is the universal now, but all moments together form the universal now. The past still exists and the future already exists, all simultaneous as a timeless four-dimensional entity. In my series I give three philosophical and three scientific arguments to support this view of time. Since I don't want this video to be too long I will focus on the scientific arguments. Static time finds its roots in Greek philosophy, but found its way into science through Albert Einstein. His theories of relativity gave a whole new view of the nature of space and time. Before Einstein, people saw time as an entity separate from space, like for example Isaac Newton did. But through relativity, we realized that time and space are expressions of the same entity. If there is no space, there is no time, and if there is no time, there is no space. General relativity shows us how there is demonstrably a fourth dimension of space as objects form dense in the fabric of space, known as a gravity well. The more heavy an object is, the deeper the dent and smaller objects follow the natural shape of space. This is how the planets move around the sun. Even more interesting is that the flow of time is different depending on where you are located in space. Inside a gravity well, the flow of time slows down as has been confirmed by experiments with atomic clocks. Time is relative to the location of the observer. There is no universal now as being a single moment within the universe. Quantum mechanics also supports this view, as the whole notion of before and after can break down at the quantum level. Particles can be at two places at the same time as shown in the slit experiment. Particles can be present at one place and then on another without having traversed the actual distance. And the quantum uncertainty principle establishes that the momentum and location cannot be measured simultaneously. I of course deal with these arguments more in depth in the series itself. Apart from that I also give three philosophical arguments to show that dynamic time is actually a very inconsistent view of time. The implications of static time are that the universe itself would be a timeless entity consisting only of at least four dimensions of space and what we call time is merely a progression of three dimensional slices or segments of the spatial fourth dimension. The Big Bang would not be the beginning of the universe in the temporal sense, but could better be described as the four-dimensional edge of the universe, where the four dimensions of space meet. Time would be like a road you are walking on. A road doesn't come into existence with each step you take, but the whole road is already laying there before you, and the places you have walked on already still exist. This implies that premise 2 of the Kalam argument is without support. Neither the Big Bang nor the finitude of the universe could establish that the universe began to exist. 
In that respect, the universe would be like God itself, a timeless being that never began to exist nor ever ceases to exist. You could compare it to the timeline of a YouTube video. It has a beginning and an end, but the video does not begin to exist at the first second, nor does it go out of existence at the end. Also, at the first second, all the other seconds are already in existence. They all exist simultaneously next to each other rather than after each other. In our universe, what we call the moments of time are actually locations within a four-dimensional shape. If this view of time is correct, which I think both philosophy and science shows it is, the Kalam argument has been falsified due to the second premise being false. The universe effect did not begin to exist, but exists timelessly, 